Hey friends, it's your pal Mike Shea from Sly Flourish here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy GM Prep. In this weekly show, I go through steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my Sunday role-playing game. In this case, I am running the 5e hardcover adventure Scarlet Citadel by Kobold Press. This show, like all of the work of Sly Flourish, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to the City of Arches source book, a whole bunch of exclusive adventures, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, a dedicated Discord channel and the monthly Q and A, along with other other lots of other little things too. And it's a really good deal. You should check it out. There is a link to become a patron down in the show notes below. And to the patrons of Sly Flourish, thank you so much for your support. We are in level three. The Dwarven Barracks is where we are currently, where our, where our game currently is set. So last session, the characters had defeated. Kagoth Z, the time, the time mage, they managed to, I think they, you know, careful use of like command and then some, some tricky business. And I think they like, they like grabbed the ring. He was, he was hiding in his temporal rift. That's really dangerous. And they just plucked his ring off that protected him from the temporal rift. And as they did so, he shrunk down, he, he de-aged many hundreds of years until he just he just he just turned into a little bit of biomatter and floated away and that was the end of kagoth z so they rest that that meant that they had his location they were happy with his location they wanted to take a rest so they did they took a rest and they oh, here's a kitty say hello kitty hello everybody i'm crawling on a lap come on so they they took a long rest there and in his his area felt relatively safe and i was like you don't really you know one of the things about scarlet citadel that i like to do is i like to shake things up so every time they have managed to displace one of the major villains or change something something else kind of happens and moves in and ideally something that the characters already know about something maybe that they either caused like in this case or, or or just something that they already know about so like on level one once they got rid of the jailer and once the priest lady left the barrier between the dust lands and the rest of the world there kind of weakened and when it weakened, it meant the undead can now sort of roam through the first level. So the first level of Scarlet Citadel is now filled with undead. Then level two, they were dealing with uh, Daneska Maskalov, who was like the master of oozes. She, she had all kinds of like experiments. She had one of the, the icosahedrons, one of these super powerful sources of the weird weaver that she was channeling to make weird oozes. And she was doing so. She had a whole bunch of different oozes that she was making. And they defeated Daneska, and I think she melted into an ooze thing herself, and then the ooze that she was in floated off. And they'd already been, like, hurling oozes and commanding oozes into this one big central chamber on the second floor, which meant that chamber is filling up with crazy powerful ooze things. And I thought it would be fun if a, what we, what we call Daneska pod, that a, an ooze that has got sort of the sentience of Daneska Maskalov showed up, and it did, and they, they fought it. And they used their ooze command on it and commanded her to, I, I think it, it, they, they can't remember if they're charming or commanding her, but they were like, we want to get her away. And so they said, like, we want you to lead us. So this is one. And this is something that like the players and I have to debate of like when you do something like a suggestion, it's like, well, how much of a suggestion can you do? And what can it gain? And I was like, you're not going to convince something that was ready to eat your face off to suddenly lead you to the lowest levels of the Citadel. That's too much. But if you could convince it that there's tastier, eaty things somewhere else, they'll, they'll do that. So they actually went with that. They convinced her to, hey, there's tasty troll things down one level. Why don't you go there? And she said, oh, that sounds good. And she turned and she oozed her way off the precipice and down into level three. And they're like, well, now we're just going to have to face her in level three. And like, well, you know, hey, we don't have to fight her right now. So they prepared themselves. They made their way down the stairs. One, one thing we can do here is let's pull up our owlbear map. I am using Owlbear Rodeo 2.0, which I think is still in beta, but it's available, owlbear.app. So they made their way back down, down these stairs here. Let's get some of this cruft away. Boop, boop, boop. There we go. So they, they came down the stairs and they were hiding up there and they saw that there's now a bunch of trollkin that were down here. 
And the Trollkin were just lurking around. And all of a sudden, the Trollkin started freaking out and going down to the south, down in the murdery room, as the, the players labeled the rooms as they've been going, which is kind of a fun thing. They can, they can add their own labels to kind of keep track of what's where. So they saw that the Trollkin were then like running down there. And then they heard a bunch of screaming and like a Trollkin came back and he's all burned. And they're like, what's going on? And then they, one of them went and alerted more Trollkin. And those Trollkin came down to the armory. And they went into the, the, the murder holes here on the, on the south. I should use my little laser pointer. They came down here and they, but that doesn't work because they're fighting Dineskapod. And Dineskapod can go through tiny little holes. So Dineskapod went through the murder holes in the other direction. The players, the characters are all watching all this. So they're hearing it. They don't even know what's exactly what's going on. But I'm like, oh, this is what's going on. Dineskapod goes through the murder holes, kills a bunch of Trollkin. Then some really powerful Trollkin, the Reavers and stuff, started showing up. And they defeated Dineskapod. And then they went back and they yelled at the other ones and they went away. And then there's like a burned guy and another guy. And they're like, well, we just saw a bunch of Trollkin get wiped out. That's, that's, that's good. Right? And then they went out and I think they fought the Trollkin and defeated the Trollkin. But it was loud enough that they had alerted Trollkin Reaver in this chamber who had a lich hound. Lich hounds are, are, are pretty powerful, pretty powerful beasts. I think they're in, are lich hounds? Lich hound. We're going to talk about open 5e a bit too. So the lich hound, pretty powerful. CR4, 119 hit points. It hits hard, it does a bite attack that's 10 strength and then has this gut rip, which is if it knocks, a, 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 just a, knocks someone prone, it can do 19 slashing damage. DC 14 con save or be incapac- incapacitated. And they attacked Dorn. So this is really, this is really fun. This was almost like, do we have to X card this? I was like, I want to be careful because I'm getting gory. But the idea is that Dorn, the character, is a shade who has inhabited the body of a guy named Potter. And Mez, Rumsalith, has been trying to make sure that Potter's body stays preserved enough that he can send Potter back through the afterlife in a good manner. So the physical body of of Potter is very important to Mez. And Dorn doesn't really care so much about the body except that he's inhabiting it currently. This is all the character-driven stuff. Well, what that means is when a lich hound knocks you, pr- bites you and knocks you prone and then gut rips you and then runs off with your intestines, that Dorn was like, oh, that sucks. And Mez is like, oh, like that. <laughs> I'm trying to keep that body well-preserved. So... Trigger warning for discussion of internal gross things happening to internal organs. So prepare yourself. But it's mostly in comedic Benny Hill-like fun. So Dorn gets knocked prone, gets gut ripped by the Lich Hound. The Lich Hound grabs all of his guts and starts running with it, leaving streams of it coming out behind him. Then ethereal jaunts to go attack another to go up to go attack another creature, which means now the ropes of intestine are going through another world. And then pop back out again. I said, it's sort of like the rope and poltergeist where it's like going through the closet, but also through the ceiling that there's now like this, you know, and he's trying to grab them and they're like getting pulled across space and time. And it, the, the, the lich hound is fighting somebody else. Then the lich hound ethereal jaunts again, which means now there's two paths that the in- ropes of intestines are going through, jumps over, gut rips an- another character. <laughs> and now they're all mixed up. So now there's another person's stuff mixed up. And they're like, it's like untangling two yo-yos that got twisted together. And <laughs> I was like, I'm trying to be careful to make sure everybody's okay with this because it's a little gross, but it's also kind of funny. And they were, yeah. And so they like at the end of this, they're like, trying to detangle all, all of themselves and and mez i i made me, i didn't i didn't make mez roll for like a system i did have mez roll a system shock check but it was a mechanical free system shock so it was like you just feel your heart stop in your chest not so much like you're actually paralyzed and can't do actions i didn't take any actions away but i did roll on the lazy i i use this all the time i should pull this up give me a give me a moment here oh i'm gonna try my new tricks so if i do companion and i hold down the the command key and I open it. Oh, that's so nice. I've learned some tricks. I've learned some search tricks. They make my life very easy. So we go to table contents here and it was under stress effect. So the Lazy DM's companion, I have a stress effects table and it has like, you slip in a mental vision of a restful place or your heart seems to stop in your chest or physical pain and burning racks your body. You can use this table. This is one of my favorite tables and I use this often. And I've been using like the madness table previously. It's in the Lazy DM's workbook. I don't like the madness table as much for a bunch of reasons, but one is this has more options on it, which I like. So 
this one page thing, you can use this. You can use it for a lot of different purposes. But one thing is if you just want to do like a, a like a role play kind of syst- like system shock check where like your familiar dies, but you don't want to like take actions away from the player, right? You don't want the player to do less. You can just roll on the stress effects and say this happens to you. But then don't take any of the things away. Some of these would be hard, like, you know, you find yourself unable to move or speak, but yet you can. But it's like, you could just say, like, you feel this coming over you, but then you manage to break free. You could do something like that. You can also use it, so you can use it directly for a stress effect thing. If you actually have an effect, like like somebody does a stun or a fear, you could roll on this instead. And then the other thing you could do is when you're using, like, a an effect that does take away actions from the characters, and it legitimately does, one of the things you can do is this, this on a failed save, you determine how long the effect lasts. On a failed save, the character becomes stunned for one minute the character can repeat the saving throw at the end of their turns whenever they take the damage ending the effect if the character saving throw is successful the effect ends for it and the character is immune to the effect of 24 hours. so like a fear a character can also choose to break this effect at the start of their turn by taking four psychic damage per two character levels because i don't like d4s a lesser restoration or equivalent spell can likewise the effect you can also apply this mechanism for breaking an effect applied effect by taking psychic damage to characters who are frightened stunned or incapacitated so anytime you're using frightened stunned or incapacitated anything where you're taking actions away you could use this idea that they can take psychic damage to break free from it and and you could still roll the stress effects table anytime they're taking frightened stunned or incapacitated you roll on this to be like well what kind of fright it's a little bit of a role play but then you can also say and if you're willing to take some psychic damage which is like if you're six level you have to take 3d8 psychic damage which is about 12 points of psychic damage to break free so it's enough that you're like ooh, i don't know 12 is a lot but it's not so much that you wouldn't be willing to take it. you only take 2d8 psychic damage to break out of an effect if you are a if you're fifth level so pretty reasonable. But you can also just roll on this effect without tying it to anything and just make them do that like, like when it's fun. And that's what I did is when it was fun. I had it and, and met room. when Room Celeste saw the body that she's trying to keep preserved getting disemboweled by a lich hound and teleporting around with the with the with the gutty with the guts. I was like, that sounds like a system shock check to me. Like time time to do that. But without I don't want to punish the player for role playing things. And that's a role playing thing. So instead you just say like your heart stops. <laughs> Like you're having a heart attack while you're watching this thing run around with your your friends your friends your friends guts. I think my cameras. There we go. Focus on my camera is not perfect. But that was fun. So they defeated the guy. They defeated Lichon, which was really hard. Then they started looking in this next chamber and saw that some barricades had been set up. And they're like, oh, they know we're here now, and they're getting ready for it. So they one of the characters has a, a way to touch a body and learn what the body knew over like the past minute. So that way they were able to see through the body's memories that it had it had learned that the characters are coming. It ran down here. It met it met a bunch of trollkin and they said, well, go back out there and protect us. But we're going to set up the barricades. And then it set up the barricades. And that's what all these guys are. You can kind of see that they're 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 sort of around. So the start of this scene is there's a whole pile of trollkin characters are five or six. I think they might only be level five. I can't remember. I, I think I, I think I said this. Here, let's find out. They're fifth level. So at fifth level, facing this many guys is is going to be a problem. That's a lot of people. So I want to think about that when we're doing our prep today. I want to also come up with like a strong start, and I've got an idea for a strong start that I think is going to be that's, that I think is going to be fun. That's going to shake things up, right? We want to shake things up. So let's get our notes ready for today. As always, I'm using Notion to do my campaign planning. If you want to learn more about using Notion for your campaign planning, you can find a link to it in the show notes below. So we're going to generate a new session planning template. It's a new session set of notes. We click on the generate session planning template. And today is 12 February 2023. Scarlet Citadel. Our characters include, I think we have a full house today. So we're going to have six characters. So maybe they can take out that many people. It's going to be interesting to see. We have Bart, played by Jay, a Gearforged Bard diplomat. Bart, Bart really loves charming stuff. Jay also really loves charming stuff. He loves, is his big tagline that he's used in every campaign we've played is, if he could be churned, it could be a powerful ally. So he's real big on charming. The problem with charming stuff, I don't mind stuff getting charmed. I mind bosses getting charmed. So... You know, I think I think we're going to, you know, make an agreement that like you don't charm bosses and I won't come up with a way to dick your charms. But, you know, charming normal stuff, totally cool and still really valuable. If you charm like a 56 hit point monster, you just did 56 damage in one hit. So I think charming normal dudes is totally fine. But charming bosses. 
so Bart is a Gearforge diplomat who's kind of here to find himself. He thinks that there's some reason he's down here. And so he's down here in the Scarlet Citadel trying to figure out, trying to find himself. Doran Greycastle, played by Joe, I've talked about it, is a fighter sorcerer because he likes shield is a walking around in the body of a, of a man named Potter, whose body is now getting more and more destroyed as they're going and harder to harder to, to, for, for, for room Celeste to rebuild. And Doran is trying to find his way back. He, he came from the forgotten realms. He's trying to find his way back there, I think, but he also doesn't know if he's, he's just dead and he just needs to go to the spirit realm. So there's a whole big tie into the whole part of this adventure that gets into the river Styx, which is flowing through the lower levels of the Scarlet Citadel. We have Garble played by Pat. Garble is a mushroom folk rogue far traveler who's trying to find a nice place for his people to live down here in Scarlet Citadel, which certainly seems like that could that could be there. We have Mez, Rumseleth, played by Sharon, is a frost elf fighter parfumier who is trying to make sure that, that Dorn doesn't destroy Potter's body so much that Potter can't be laid to rest as well. How that's going to play out is going to be interesting. We have Sister Malarkey Jones, played by Jerry, is a warlock cleric, tiefling noble, who follows chaos and rolls die to see what is going to happen and joined up with Skrink Skibbers to come down here and help protect the Weird Weaver. The Weird Weaver being this entity of, it's like an entity of chaos, which sounds bad, but it's like the entity of randomness in the world, which is still very important. We have Skrink Skibbers played by Juliet, is a rat folk wizard occultist, was sacrificed by cultists in Zobek, then brought back to life by the Weird Weaver, who said, I need you to help protect the randomness of the universe by coming and helping me. And so Skrink and, and Malarkey both made their way down to Red Tower because they, they knew that there was something going on there. So those are the six characters that we have today. Hey, my mom is here. Hi, mom. So I think the, the, the strong start, so where, they're, where they are right now, the situation they're in right now is they're holed up in this room. I think they just set fire to these barriers. I think they fired off like a, a, a flaming torch and set fire the barriers are ablaze that's an interesting bit of chaos a whistle blows from behind them and two owlbear roars echo through the chambers from behind so my thought is the trollkin are not a bunch of idiots like the trollkin are smart so what they said is like, we know that they're up there in the barrier. We're not, even though there's a lot of us here, we're not going to just sit here and wait for the characters to bash through the barriers. We are going to do a pincer move. And the pincer move is they went down here. Let me get my little laser pointer. They went down here to the owlbear, uh, the owlbear barracks, whatever they're called. The owlbear, what is it called? Kennels, right? They got out two of the owlbears. I don't know how many owlbears are there. Probably not. Maybe four. They got two of them and they used their little whistle to get the owlbears to run this way and then through this way. They did not shoot them through murdery room two. They opened out, opened up this door and they led them out into this hall. But we kited them around the hall and then ran back and closed the door and then left the two owlbears in here. And then they quickly, someone else uses the whistle here, which then gets the owl bears to want to make their way north and then come in and attack the characters. An owl bear is going to have to like squeeze through that, that room, but maybe it, it will start tearing apart the wall and maybe it'll tear apart the wall and, and, and make an opening that's big enough for the owl bear. I think that that would be a fun, I think that that would be a fun way for, for it to go. So I think we're going to have... The strong start be that the you know, two owlbear roars echo through the chambers from behind owlbears, trained owlbears, right? These are, uh, these are dire owlbears are coming from behind. So that's cool. One of the things, here's a, here's a, we're going to, we're going to take a little segue here to do a thing. I am toying around with a new feature for the, the lazy campaign template in Notion. And that is a feature called the 5e artisanal monster database. The 5e Artisanal Monster Database is a database built in Notion. It was actually pulled, much of the material, the, the material is pulled from a few different places, but the primary source recently was Open 5e, which I will show you. You can see the URLs for here are all Open 5e URLs. And I was able, Open 5e actually allow, gives access to a lot of OGL released information, including Toma Beast 1, Toma Beast 2, the Creature Codex, and the 5e SRD in glorious 
easily parsable JSON. And it's all the monster stats because all that stuff is under OGL. And I harvested that and I built it into a database in Notion. And then I added two other data sources, which are also under OGL. One, Toma Beast 3, and th two, the Monsters Menagerie from Level Up 5e. So I have the material from those sources as well. And that means I have one database that has 5e SRD, which is like most much of the stuff from the D&D Monster Manual, not everything, but some, uh, most of it. The Monstrous Menagerie, which is that stuff plus a lot of other stuff that they've made, and also different stat blocks for the same monsters that are available in 5e, most of them. Tome of Beast 1, Tome of Beast 2, Tome of Beast, Tome of Beast 3, and Creature Codex, all in one thing. It ends up being, I think, about 2,500 monsters worth of stuff. And the way this works is you can do a search here, and you can say Albear. And it has Albear, Albear Recluse from the Mon Monsters Menagerie, the Albear from the 5e SRD, and the Dire Albear from the Tome of Beast 3. Now, the Tome of Beast 3 doesn't have a link. But let's say we wanted to look up one of the Monsters Menagerie, the Albear Recluse. It has the link right in, and you can click it and go right to the Albear Recluse from Toma Beast, from, from the Monsters Menagerie. So a big question comes up with, oh, wow, this is really great and I love this thing. How do I use this in my existing Lazy DM campaign template? And I'm going to show you now. So what we do is we go down here, we go down to the 5e artisanal database. This is available in the, in the main Lazy DM companion template. And I'm going to duplicate this. Now, in mine, it's going to duplicate in here because I have permissions. For you, it's a where do you want to duplicate it? And it would duplicate it somewhere else. It takes a little bit to duplicate it because it's duplicating 2,500 records that are inside this database. So it's got a lot of stuff there. So there it is. And now I'm going to move this and we're going to move it to Scarlet Citadel. So now it disappeared. So now I go back to my Scarlet Citadel link and I already had the creature database, but this is an old one. So I'm going to delete this one. And that screws up my combat tracker. We'll get to that in a second. So now I have my 5e artisanal database. And I'm going to put it here. But one really important thing is I want to rename it to Scarlet Citadel Creature Database. And I don't need all these notes because I wrote them. And that's to help you understand what to do. And I already know what to do because I wrote it. So now I have my Scarlet Citadel Creature Database in here. And the reason why we rename it is so when we reference it somewhere else, we can reference this specific creature database. Not if you, if you have multiple campaigns like I do, you want to name each creature database differently so that you're not putting it all into one database and that will crud up each database. I suppose you could have like one master database that all of your campaigns go to, but I don't know if there's a real advantage to that. And in the meantime, you want to, you're, you're going to want to screw with your own campaign database. So... Yeah, but here's here's an example. So we want to take a look at the dire owl bear that's available in Toma Beast three. So we're gonna find that Toma Beast three. We are going to open that up and let's pop this open. We are gonna go to index. We are gonna is it under owl bear or is it under dire owl bear? Let's find out. Dire owl bear. There it is. So we have our dire owl bear. Close that. And what we're gonna do? Let's boost this just a bit. I don't need that dire owlbear in Midgard thing. I am going to grab a screenshot of this that has the stat block, save that to my clipboard, go into my Scarlet Citadel artisanal monster database, and say owlbear. Go to my dire owlbear. Now, I don't have the stats in here because Tome Beast 3, there isn't a good structured source for the stats. But that's okay because I can paste the stat block right into the page. And now... When I load that up, I, I have that I have that handy. You can see some of the stats are already here. I have its challenge rating. I have its armor class. I have its hit points. That's already in there, so I could do my my tracking of that in in here. One thing. Oh, I have to change this name too. Now for the encounter tracker, I have an encounter tracker here too. Scarlet Citadel Combat Tracker. This now doesn't work anymore, and it doesn't work because it's tied to the old database which I just deleted, and there's no good way to. Look at all these encounters I've got. So I have this like Trollkin encounter. So now it's clear. Because I moved a new database over, it's not tied. That when, you, when you do a view from another page, that view is always tied to whatever original database you did. And I don't know the way to shift the view over to a different database and still have it hold everything together. It doesn't really, it doesn't really work. So instead, I have to create a new view. Let me say table view. And look, Scarlet, let's see, Scarlet Citadel. Did I call it a creature database? What did I call it? I went through all this trouble to rename it something. Scarlet Citadel Creature Database. All right. This is not useful now. Delete. So we do a table view. It doesn't look like it indexed it yet. Oh, this is why. There we go. I didn't call it the same thing. Go to the combat tracker. 
Table, table view. Scarlet Citadel creature database. Bang, right? Now, the trick here is this is not what, this view is not useful at all. So I need to do a filter, and we're going to filter by encounter. So we create an encounter called Trollkin. We create a new encounter called Trollkin encounter. And then we say we want to filter only by the stuff that's in the Trollkin encounter. And that shows us this. I added the giant fire beetle to it, which doesn't make any sense. So what we do is we go back to the database, but now I've got that set up. Go to the creature database, and we're going to say Trollkin. We're going to remove that there. And we're, we have Trollkin grunts. So we're going to say Trollkin encounter. We can actually delete this one because the Dark Hole don't exist in this, in this campaign. Or Dark Hole, we're not doing Dark Hole stuff. We have Trollkin, I think I was using the grunts as raider. I was changing the name of raiders and grunts to make them to make them bitter, bigger. And then we have the reavers are pretty tough. So we're going to add those to the Trollkin encounter. We have, oh, there's a fire shaman. That's interesting. But I think we'll just go with the regular shaman. Fire shaman might be cool because they use the new, uh, the new style of the monsters of the multiverse style of monsters. So let's take a look at that Trollkin. We have desert Trollkins. Trollkin Fire Shaman, CR2. They have a Hurl Flame attack. These are pretty good. So we're going to grab the Fire Shaman stat block. Save that to my clipboard. And we will open up the Fire Shaman. And we'll paste the Fire Shaman stat block in there. So now we've got that. And what else? So that means we don't need the Shaman. And we have the Reaver. We're not going to do an Iron Monger or Rage Caster, I don't think. So I think we're pretty good with that. Now we do want to have the owl bear. So we're going to add the dire owl bear. We're going to put that in the trollkin encounter. We got enough monsters going on. So now we go back to our combat tracker and we have the list of monsters. Now for this one, this list might be enough on its own because I don't think I'm going to be running initiative in this. I'm going to be running initiative in owl bear. So I'm, I don't need to, to order this, but just for, just for you know, to, to show how it works, what you can do is we, we created this new view. We have these monsters in here, but it's all the wrong stats. These are not the, these are not the fields that we want to be showing in here. So we go into our properties and we don't need to show CR. We do need to show the name. We don't need type. We don't need source. We don't need page. We might need the URL. So we'll keep that handy. Maybe we do need the encounter. We do want the initiative role. We want damage. We want conditions. We want armor class, we want current hit points, and we want max hit points, and we want position. And the other, let's just make sure. Yeah, that, that all looks good. Do I still have type in there? Let's see. Name, URL, we'll move the URL. I don't think we need the URL. I'm going to say that we don't need, I don't think we need URL. So we have name, and then the order that we put them in is you put the initiative role first, the name second, encounter can go in the back because we probably don't need that position goes up next to name I'll, I'll speak i'll talk about why armor class then damage current hit points max hit points condition and encounter so that's the order that we're going to put them in here and i'll i'll explain why so then we order by the descending of the initiative order and we save for everyone and so now what we have is the list of the monsters that are in here we have their position, we have their armor class, we have damage. We're going to shrink all these down. We have current hit points, we have max hit points, we have conditions. The conditions is already pre-populated, so if you want to put like incapacitated on somebody, you can just drop it on there. You can also remove it. We have one encounter they're in. We, we probably can hide this once we know the encounter, but if there are multiple encounters, you want to do something else. Now, the one thing I haven't done in here is you want to have an entry for each of the characters too. So you would have like a Dorn and then type of character, and that's already an encounter. Then you would have like Mez type character. You would have Grink type character. You don't have to fill in all the stuff either. Like I don't, I don't, I wouldn't bother filling in all the stuff. You just want a placeholder for them. We have Bart. This is a good test. Can I remember all the names of the characters without looking them up? We have, and, and as soon as I say that, I forget one of the characters' name. What's his name? The mushroom guy, Gar Gar Garble, I think that's right. And we have Malarkey, right? I remembered all the character names. Yay me. So now, and then when they roll their initiative, you could say like Malarkey has a 19, Garble has a seven, Bart has a 14, Grink has a 22, 
Mez has a 16 or 17 and Dorn has a three. And it orders them all in initiative. Then what you can do is you can create positions and you can say, this is a theater of the mind kind of thing. So you can start off by saying there are the fiery barricades. There is the central chamber and there is the rear hallway. And you can, you can say who's where. So you could say like the Trollkin grunts are in the central chamber, right? And you can, you know, Reaver's in the central chamber. And you can create all of these sort of on the fly, you know, all the, everyone else is sort of in the fiery barricades, right? And then as they move positions, you can, you can change it. And because this is multi-select, you can also say like the Trollkin Raider went after Skrink and you can create a Skrink position that says the Trollkin Raider is adjacent to Skrink. And it's a way of showing positioning abstractly without a map. And then what you do is you screenshot this and you only screenshot the initiative, the name and the position. And you can throw that right into Discord so they can see where their turn is in initiative, who the inhabitants are of this particular battle, and what their abstract location is. So it works really well for theater of the mind. I'm not really using it right now because I'm using Albert Rodeo because we have all these beautiful Scarlet Citadel maps. So I don't really need to use all this. But I wanted to show like how the combat tracker, how the combat tracker can work. If you're really OCD, you would put in things like the armor class and hit points of the characters. I wouldn't bother because it changes too much and you don't want to be updating this constantly. One other trick that I forgot to mention is when you are pulling this from the creature database, you actually want to duplicate the entry, uh, so that when you're modifying the entry, you are not modifying the master entry for that creature. So I would duplicate every one of these and have the duplicate be the one that's in an encounter. That way I can change its name, and that way I'm not screwing with the original one that's in the original database. So this is the this is a preview. What I'm showing you right now is a preview of the 5e artisanal monster database and the combat tracker. They are in the template now. You can try them out right away. You can see what I did to, if you want to add them to an existing one. I give no guarantees that I'm not going to keep screwing with this. So I'm, I'm, I'm still messing with all of this to try to get it really right. Because you can see parts of it are a little clunky. I'm wondering how to streamline it. If you have ideas about how to streamline this, you can tell me on Discord or you can tell me on, you can leave a comment in YouTube. If you're not a patron, you can leave a comment on YouTube. If you're a patron, jump in the Discord and you can tell me there. But I'm curious about streamlining it. That was a long time to talk about the Scarlet Citadel or to talk about the creature database and the combat tracker, especially considering I'm not really using it. So let's come back and let's let's work more on a character. So the scenes are, what is happening now, man? I'll tell you, things are breaking down. There we go. So the scenes are, owlbears are coming. Owlbears are a coming. We have face off with the Trollkin. And then we probably have moving into the clacking caves or moving down below, moving to the back caves, right? It depends on which path they take because there's a couple different paths that they could be that they could be taking. If they once they deal with the trolls and they move down here, there is a big pit that goes here and that area drops one whole level or you take the hallway here. And I kind of don't know what direction they're going to go. So I'm going to sort of leave that open and, you know, they can, they can figure it out because yeah, there's, 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 you know, a big fork in the direction that they, a big fork that in the direction that they're going to go. So that's, that's really like moving to the bat caves or moving to the clack, clacking caves. There's also the, the one thing, and I want them to, I want them to kind of explore it is that to the North, there's that tomb. And in that tomb is the hammer and the hammer lets them into these other vaults. So one of the secrets and clues is there are many vaults to various gods and heroes here built by the dwarves and containing valuable treasures and artifacts. That's one secret. Some of these tombs are in the clacking caves to the east, through the eastern tunnel. I want to do that because if we if we look at Scarlet Citadel, if you look at the clacking the 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 so so the dwarven barracks is two big part parts, the trollkin parts and the clacking caverns. Clacking caverns is what it's called. And there's not a fantastic reason. Let's see if there's a map for it. So this is the eastern side, and 318 here goes to the Clacking Caverns. And we can look at the map for the Clacking Caverns. And there's a lot going on here. And I think I can do, like, the draw to the draw that this is, the like, the first tributary of the River Styx. And that could draw them in. 
there's a lot of neat stuff back here. And I don't want them to miss that by just going deeper and deeper and deeper. I want them to kind of, you know, consider going down here to, to see this stuff. And I don't know the best way to do that without, you know, be, because there is that hole and the hole goes down the whole, you know, one whole level, one, one whole level down. So I'm not sure if anybody here who's in Twitch has a thought about why they would want to go to the clacking caverns instead of just going straight down to the bat caves below. I'm, I'm, I'm all ears for that. There is a tributary of the river Styx traveling through the eastern part of the clacking caverns. Clacking caverns is more fun to say. Yes, definitely. Yeah, to revive items of power, to retrieve items of power. That's, so that's why I'm giving that clue that there are vaults of various gods that are there. Yeah, the Black River, it's called, right? But I guess giving them the options of like they can, they can, you know, they can decide what they what they see and what they face where. I think that that could that that could work fine. So one one big question I have is what if you're facing all of these trollkin? What do the trollkin want? And I think it's important that the trollkin fear Immorta. They have a loose alliance to not let anything pass. At the same time, they'd rather not all be killed. Yeah, I'm trying to think if like, you know, so it's, there's a very obvious combat focus here. But what are some possible role play opportunities here? That if we look at if we if we look at and I forget his name. I suck with names. I think we put it in in last week's notes. So let me let me go to last week's notes. And normally I go through all the secrets, but we're a little tight on time. They, oh, Labascalag La, La, La is a good source. So Bar is their leader. These, these are all, yeah. So we're going we're gonna to grab these NPC names and drop them in because those names are all still relevant. Uh, we, we, you know what? We are going to go through the secrets because I think some of those secrets are still useful. And that would, whoops, that would save me a little bit of time. Third Adrian of the Weird Reaver resides in a chamber of the fifth level Scarlet Citadel. That we, they did not learn that. Energy from the third Echosahedron being drawn and terrible, they didn't learn that. Fourth Echosahedron resides in the lowest depths of Scarlet Citadel. They didn't learn that. These are all things they didn't learn. Weird Weaver isn't a god or primordial or anything like that. It's a shade they didn't learn that. And more of the debased travels among the levels. Gellert needs to liaison with the inhabitants. Didn't learn that. Factions of Dara war on the lower, on war with one another in the lower levels. All these are good. In order to debase, to use the power of the third Icosahedron to summon all sorts of terrible, horrible entities. I think I did that twice, right? Didn't we already have that? Fourth, We can delete that one. Each of these creatures must be destroyed. I think we're going to take this part of that secret and tie it to this part, which is that Immorta is the one who summoned them. And then we can delete this guy. Some of the creatures tied to the Icosahedron are as old as the Citadel itself. You have many vaults and tombs exist in the lower levels filled with untouched artifacts. Yes. The drawn energy of Dineska ooze is pulled from the twisting of the ley lines. We did learn that. The Trollkin are conscripted by, by Immorta the Debased to keep intruders from making their way down. Yes, Trollkin enjoy raiding the surface. Yes. Two other Reavers are his lieutenants. A Gale AI yeah, stole that. So we're going to, you know, hey, we're just going to, don't tell anybody. We're just going to steal all these secrets and drop them right in. One of those, we don't need that. We don't need this guy. Because I, I made, I planned out a bunch of secrets last time that didn't really get, that didn't really get viewed. So that's good, but I think we already had that one, right? Yeah, so we can we can delete this guy because I already have that one. We already had, let's see. Yeah, we can get rid of this. So these are all good. This one we can we can just move lower because it's not going to come up. So we've got, you know, hey, look, I, I did all my secrets and clues. Look at me, I'm working hard. We're going to wipe that out. So the question is, so what's the Deadly Encounter benchmark? We're way over it. I can tell you that. So they have six characters. They are level five, which means the benchmark goes bang. It jumps that, that thing where now it's half of the, half the sum total of character level of, of monster CRs. If it is, if half the sum total of monster CRs is greater than the level of the character, the sum total of the character levels, we're in trouble. So the character, oh no, half the level of the characters. Is that right? I get, I get my own benchmark confused. The characters are there. Are, yeah, it's half the sum of all the character levels. So there are thirty character levels. Five times six is thirty, and we cut that in half as fifteen. So the deadly encounter. If we have more than fifteen challenge ratings worth of monsters, it is potentially a very dangerous encounter. I am not going to worry about treasure because there's treasure in the book. And again, time is tight, so we're not going to worry about that. And the monsters, we all put those in the encounter. Right, we we have those. We have that list of monsters in our combat tracker. So we are we don't we don't really need to have that list of monsters because we have them right here. 
So I think, yeah, so we're all set with, with Mont. In fact, what I'll do is I'll just, uh, I'll do a cross link. You can, one thing you can do is if you don't want to use the encounter builder, if you're not really interested in using the encounter builder part, you can actually just list your monsters straight from here and say Trollkin. And we have that like Trollkin Fire Shaman, right? And Trollkin, you just want to make sure you're pulling from the right database. So we have like the Trollkin Raider, the Grunt. You got to just make sure, I, I have so many copies of the database. Why is that other grunt not showing up? Now, you see, it's pulling it from my Light of Zaraxxus database. That's not that's not where I want it from. I want it from Scarlet Citadel. That is the problem with having, I think, four copies of this database. And it looks like that one didn't get didn't get didn't get pulled up yet. But you can see we can do the reaver though. The reaver. There we go. And then we'll do the dire owlbear. So we have our list. And then the nice thing is you say, oh, tri Trollkin Fire Shaman. You know, open that up. Oh, look. There's the stat block that I copied and pasted earlier. So now we have it. And it was pretty easy to set that stuff up. So that's that's pretty handy. It's just handy to keep your list of monsters that you that you want to have that you want to have here. So let's see. We don't need the scratch pad because I'm using Owlbear. And we keep our session notes because we, we definitely want to have our session notes that we keep track of during the game. Why did this this got indented somehow? So I think we are I think we're pretty well set. Like I'm going to, you know, it's playing a lot of it by ear. I guess the one question I, I still remains, the one, the one trick that I have to think about. Well, one, I guess one thing I want to look at is, did I do any magic items? I, I pulled out the magic items. So I was like, ah, oh, we don't need them. But did I have any magic items that I did not? Yeah, these are kind of cool. I thought I might have. And I don't think I gave any of these away. So we're going to take these and we're going to put in our notes as well. So I do have some treasure. There we go. Just stuff that we rolled up last time that I'm going to drop in here. Evil Twin Moon says, I did find the treasure in the underwater puzzle is completely underwhelming, and that is somewhat difficult to figure out. <coughs> Ugh, I got my throat all jacked up again. Man, I hear coffee's really good for a cough. Someone on the internet told me that. So we got our session notes. We got our treasure. We got monsters. We got NPCs. The big question is like, I would love, you know, if you have a conversation with the Trollkin, what could the characters offer the Trollkin other than not being killed? that would get the Trollkin to let them go further. I guess one of them is like, maybe the Trollkin really don't like what's been going on down there. Hate Immorta, but fear her and what they're doing down there. If they send anyone through, they could face repercussions. Uh, so what, what could the character, how can, what guarantees could the characters give to the Trollkin to let them pass? Maybe they want something? So what if there's an artifact? What if there's an artifact? You could give him a quest. So let's take a quick look through rooms 19 through 31. Did I lose my... No, this is, this is the right. So we're going to look at 19 through 31 and say, is there an artifact down there? So there's the treasure in the pool. That could be fun. That's an, that's an area 19, right? That's an area 20. I kind of don't like that they go one cave. I kind of like that it's in 31. So let's let's take a look at room 331. Oh, that's the act. That's an, another access to the back cave. So that doesn't really help. So what about? I guess we'll we'll go in reverse order. 330. I kind of want them that the trollkin might want something that's deeper in the cackling caverns. Copper coffin contains a beautiful but non magical sword and scale armor that allows the wearer to make stealth checks normally, and grants the wearer swim speed. They probably don't want that. Vampire Bane crossbow. That's kind of cool. That's in 28. What if it's like a helm? Let's, let's, you know, I think that like the, the shaman, this, this could be. So let's, let's go make a, an uncommon magic item. We'll do Midgard and we're going to put deep magic spells on it. Boiling oil. Lopian elven plus one great axe of Ninkash, the Southern mother of beer. That's kind of cool. What I'm thinking is maybe there's an artifact that exists in the tomb that the troll can have heard of and say, I want this. A, and I don't think, and do any of the characters want a great axe? I don't know. Half plate armor of Boreas, the devouring wind that casts sudden dawn. Look at this. Poisonous feyish set of eyes of charming of, of, of Chernabog, the black god that casts ancestor strength. That's kind of fun. I think I want it to be a helm, and it, but of what god? Here's look, Radiant Gnomish set of gauntlets of Ogre Power of Thor, the Northern Thunderer, that casts Claws of Darkness. I like the gauntlets of Ogre Power of Thor. That's pretty cool. We're going to grab those and throw those into the treasure. I want it to be something that the, the characters, I, I think I think it might be fun. Oh, why did I do that? Put that in the treasure. 
I like the idea of a helm that's been calling out to him, right? Helm of Loki that's been calling out to the Trollkin leader. He wants it back. And I think that's far off. So like, you know, I like that we were using all the Norse gods because like Loki, the trickster god would absolutely like a, a, a helm that's of Loki. That's very old. That's buried in this tomb. And the Trollkin wants it because it's been calling out to him. And the Loki helm wants the Trollkin because he's got a weak intellect and I can take him over. I could take you over or you could just give me him. I think that might be fun. And then he puts it on and he becomes a lot smarter. And maybe it's like a helm of Loki. That's also if I make it too good, then the characters are going to want to keep it. And I don't, I don't think they will, but it could be like, I, it, you know, sort of like a headband of intellect. I think that could be fun. So now they have a reason. So if they, if they want to negotiate with the Trollkin, they can. And we can put this as a secret. We'll drop this pretty up, pretty up front, right? And what's his name? Bryn, Bryn, Brynjar. I'm never going to spell that. B.J. Ryan. Brynjar wants a helm kept in the tombs deeper in the cackling caverns that's been calling out to him retrieve it and the trollkin will give the characters access through the dwarven barracks <clears throat> so now they have a role play option that feels good so i think we're all set i think i've i've, I've reviewed my characters got my strong start we've got scenes the, the, you know, i don't know if they're gonna fight the owlbears or they're gonna be like no screw the owlbears we're gonna burst our way in and then they might see like oh my god we have owlbears behind us we got these guys in front Nego they could try to succeed they could they could they could fight their way through i don't think i'm going to make it too crazy you know hard that they can't succeed but they might also be able to they might also be able to negotiate their way through but then they have to they have to go to the cackling caverns to get this thing but they get a whole bunch of other loot out there as well they get a bunch of things other than a helm but they, they gotta bring the helm back and they bring the helm back to brynjar and brynjar will put it on and then he becomes like a loki shaman and he's like oh he's overtaken by it and i think Ascalag. Labaskalag will know that helm is dangerous. You do not want to put that helm on. You could be taken over by stuff. So I think that could be, I think that could work really well. So I think we've got our notes. I think we're all set today. So I want to thank everybody for hanging out with me today while I prepared for my Sunday RPG. If you enjoyed the show and you want more content like this, consider subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter. You get a weekly RPG related email sent directly to your inbox along with a free adventure generator PDF. It's completely free to sign up. You can support me directly on Patreon. I have a very low priced Patreon where you get access to all kinds of stuff. City of Arts, the source book, uncovered secrets, exclusive adventures, the monthly Patreon on q a and a dedicated discord channel it's all available through patreon and you can pick up my books at the sly flourish bookstore all of those links for all of those are in the show notes below thank you all very much have a great day and get out there and play an rpg